Perfect. So my name is Robert Shaw. I'm the Cybersecurity Specialist for Dell SecureWorks. Um, wanted to kind of give you a little bit of information about uh, what's going on in the industry, help you understand how we can use intelligence to kind of get more information about the bad guys as well as about yourself to better figure out how you can protect yourself. That's kind of my goal today, to talk a little more about. Um, I was hoping to find a little bit more about you guys if possible. Uh, how many people here are faculty and staff that currently are basically employed for uh, cybersecurity right now? How many are students currently that are looking at being in the cybersecurity industry? And how many people are here just to learn about security? Okay. Perfect. Okay, good. That, that helps more. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just look out. Let's see if I can get this working. There we go. Perfect. That little gives me a better understanding of uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking to. I can decide if I want to go a little more technical or not, but um, we'll hopefully have a chance to kind of go into more detail. Um, just to kind of give you a better understanding of what, what, we're going, what we're going through is I thought I'd give you a little bit of information about who SecureWorks is, um, give you a little bit of information about uh, um, why you want to look at intelligence, you know, what you can gain from that information, um, some of the challenges that we're experiencing through the industry right now, what kind of what areas of threat management. Get, talk about some case studies that we've seen that, that's been going on and what we're doing to kind of help protect some of the situations. Talk about uh, the kill chain. I don't know if you have heard this, this option to look at cybersecurity, but the kill chain is kind of a way to kind of better understand your uh, threat and how to respond to it. And also, uh, if we have time, we'll talk about some s steps that you can kind of do to help your, uh, when you actually do get employed and you're looking at cybersecurity, what things you can do to kind of focus on how to gain information about the, um, your own environment and how to protect it as well. Am I not loud enough? Okay. All right, I'll try to get a little closer. How's that? There we go, perfect. So let's go ahead and get started. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about SecureWorks. You know, why should you talk or hear from us? Has anybody heard of SecureWorks? Okay, that's one of the reasons I want to ask. Because uh, SecureWorks has actually been in business for over 16 years, almost 17 years now, focused only in cybersecurity. We were actually purchased by Dell about five years ago. And from there, we wanted to add on to a lot more of their um, overall their cybersecurity functionality. Um, but one of the main things that separates us is that we don't actually provide any type of hardware, software, we're vendor neutral. We don't actually sell any hardware. Our goal is to really is gain information about our clients, help them understand what they have, and help them be more efficient with what they do. And use our intelligence that we're gathering to be able to support our clients more effectively. We actually have over 2,000 employees, and we actually have over 4,100 clients already throughout the, the globe. And what we're doing is we're actually gathering intelligence. We're doing certain parts of services like firewall monitoring or security monitoring. And we're actually taking in about 150 billion events a day. That information is giving us information about what's going on in the industry so we can understand exactly how to understand our clients more effectively. And then we're going to pull information specifically from the bad guys, the cyber threats, and then be able to pull that information together so we can give a full package or a full picture of what's going on. Um, we actually are um, providing uh, services also with security risk and consulting services as well as threat uh, incident response. So whenever a client calls up and says they've been attacked, we go and help those areas and, and basically do incident response. That also gives us information about what's going on with the bad guys. All this information helps us collect this intelligence that we want to talk a little bit about, about what you want to do to gain some information. We also have a team called the C2, a counter threat unit. We've got 70 people, almost 75 people now, and all they do is basically talk, or look at the bad guys. They're actually going out there, looking at the botnets. If you're not familiar with the botnets are, it's basically already um, you know, hacked systems that, that these bad guys are using as a collective system to go after, after other people. We actually keep an eye on all of them. There are about 300 of them out there. We keep an eye on them and pull information from them. We're not actually able to take them down, but we're able to keep an eye on them. We're also able to pull information from the different uh, ransomwares, the different malwares. We actually take them in and analyze them, break them down, figure out exactly what makes them tick. This huge amount of information allows us to be able to respond and, and show exactly what we can do to help our clients more effectively. 
of course, we have um, a bunch of different threat indicators that we pull together to kind of build this information so we can kind of get it. All this intelligence is great, but if you can't turn it into actionable items and then use it specifically to go after the, the bad guys, it's not going to make effective. And that's kind of what we do. There's many different ways to gather this intelligence. One of the, the best ways we want to do it is trick the bad guys into giving us information as much as possible. We have honeypots, there's certain um, areas of information we want to gather this information, and then also getting it from multiple layers of different areas as well. The goal here is get as much information as we can to better understand what the environments are. The more information, the better. Um, and that allows us to be able to focus on this. The goal here is uh, most of the time what we're looking for is you know the how, what, and when. But our goal really is to get a little bit more information and say who and the why. The who and the why is going to allow us to be able to actually detect, respond, and actually prevent it from happening on a regular basis. All this information is going to allow you to be more effective when you're actually doing your cybersecurity. Okay, so we talked a little bit about SecureWorks. What are some of the challenges that are going on in the industry today? Well, right away you can kind of see that the cyber attacks are just going up. We're seeing it, if you look at the news, it's in politics, it's in businesses, it's pretty much everywhere. The cyber attacks are going on because there's data that can be taken and there's information that they can gather. The sad thing is about 66% of the um, information that we discover are actually are discovered by a third party. So all these businesses that actually are looking at trying to figure out how to protect, they don't even discover these um, these attacks that are going on within their own system. A third party has to come and tell them that they have this problem. This is one of the biggest issues that we have is we've got to find out how do you understand yourself more effectively. 33% of the attacks aren't even discovered within two years. So they've actually already infiltrated into the system and they're already there. Either gathering information or borrowing or stealing your bandwidth. And what we're seeing now is uh, here we've been, you've seen a lot of different solutions that come out to really kind of block and protect um, the malware, and now we're starting to realize that these attacks are now becoming a uh, non-malware. So they're actually using different tools to actually get, in, get into the system, turn off the malware so they can't be detected, and then they what we call live off the land, where they actually take over some, um, some access, user access and then basically use that information to travel around the system and go laterally. And that can't be detected through the malware. So there's got to be different ways to gather information about yourself to be able to focus more attention. And of course, the, when the breaches does happen, it it's costs so much money. The, the business can't even afford it. It's out of control. We're looking at an average of about $3.7 million in costs just to basically protect or respond and eradicate these types of threats. The second issue that we're having with uh, a lot of the, the industry today is that people like uh, you weren't getting into the job. There's not enough of you out there right now. We're, we're seeing a, a zero unemployment for cybersecurity um, professionals and we can't hire you quick enough. Um, at the same time, we're looking for qualified people who've had experience to be able to respond quickly to it. So one of the things I would add on to you while you're going through and then looking at getting your degree is figure out how you can get involved more effectively, specifically with your school or get some type of internship so you're getting some training on a regular basis to show that you have experience, not just the theory. But we're seeing a huge amount of increase on uh, not finding the right people and that's one of the biggest issues right now is that uh, there's, there's not enough people out there to be able to respond to these, these incidents when they happen. And of course, the intelligence. If you don't have enough intelligence or enough information about yourself or about the bad guy, you're not going to get the full picture. And a lot of times what happens is they're not actually responding or, or, or even understanding what's going on with their own environment. This is just an example of uh, one of the different types of attacks we see. Um, basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to find your blind spot, your weakest spot that you might have, that's what they're looking for. Whatever you might not be doing um, effectively, they're going to find that spot and exploit it. So our goal is that you can't be everywhere and, and do everything. But if you keep in the mind right now that just plan on knowing that you are going to be, it's not if, but when you get it breached. If you have that mentality right away, then you can start the process of figuring out how I can maintain an early detection solution that's going to allow me to get notified right away when something actually does happen. So we're seeing that here, a good example is that uh, they get breached. It took 314 days before they actually even noticed um, that they actually were breached. And when they finally started realizing they lost data, it took another 28 days just to actually start preparing a, an opportunity to prevent it from happening. It's, it's, it's had a code and you have to put, have plans to make sure you're prepared for this. 
Okay, so I'm talking about all the bad stuff. You know, what are some things that our clients can do to kind of start preparing and getting yourself informed um, and gaining some intelligence and knowledge about the, the industry? One of the first questions that I always like say, and, and this is what we talked about before, is that you got to admit or just know that you're going to be attacked or you might be breached or you might already be breached right now. And you have to look at this situation where it says, uh, you know, this, this is one of the questions we want you, we all our clients to focus on, is where in my infrastructure are threat actors? Who are they? What did they take? How did they get in? How do I get them out? And how do I prevent them from getting back in? It sounds like a pretty basic statement, but if you understand each of these key areas, you can actually figure out a plan to build enough information about yourself and build, put um, early warning and detections in between each of these areas before they actually get access to your data. And then what you have to do first is you have to maintain and get more visibility into your own environment. So we always talk about you need the right people, the right process, and the right technologies. Yes, you definitely need those, but you also need the intelligence. And one of the things that uh, we really want to make pride ourselves on is, is, is to figure out exactly does the technologies communicate effectively? Most times we buy technologies that's basically siloed. I have a problem, I buy a technology. I have another problem, I buy that technology. But the problem is they don't communicate. So now you have a bunch of different siloed technologies and you have to hire more people to basically reach out to that information and then figure out how to respond effectively to it. So now you have the people. The problem is you have to keep adding more people when you have the more technology. So you gotta figure out how you can use that technology more effectively so they work more closely together. And of course, the intelligence to be able to kind of give you that full picture. Um, you gotta make sure you have that piece as well. So one of the first things that we always talk with our clients about is to know yourself. It sounds basic, but most of the time, your environment, they don't know everything that's going on in their own environment. They don't know what devices that are in their environment. They don't know, you know, BYOD, how many people are coming in on a regular basis. They don't know what systems that are currently in the system. You have to know a little bit more about yourself. And that's one of the things we, we, we pride ourselves on in making sure our clients start doing is build an asset management so you know exactly what's going on in your environment and start figuring out how you can build information that's pulling information from your environment. Like, are you doing your log analysis? Are you pulling all your logs and, and downloading and storing it on a regular basis? Do you know exactly what systems you have in place? Do you know what, what, what systems are at risk? Are you doing vulnerability scans on a regular basis? All these little pieces you have to know just to get information about yourself to get yourself prepared for when the actual attack actually happens. And of course, you need to know your adversary. Um, we're hearing all these different things that are going on in the, in the industry, but you really need to fine tune, you know, what specifically, if you're focusing in the banking industry, what's your, what's your adversary specifically looking at? If you're in the education, what, you, what, what is your adversary? You need to kind of understand all the different adversaries that you are um, looking at because they're coming at you. And it could be um, some basic attacks or it could be some pretty critical ones. So you have to know your adversary. Here's a little bit about some of the adversaries that we kind of break it down into kind of four key categories. The first one is just the individuals. Basically, the individuals are looking at specific high, attack, uh, high um, availability attacks where they want to get some information from it. It's usually individuals. We can sometimes call them uh, kitty scripts where they basically are going out there and, and analyzing and going after certain information more for their own purposes, maybe for some fun, um, but they're still doing the damage. You have hacktivists, and this is when they actually have an issue or they're trying to do damage. A lot of times they're focusing specifically on how to embarrass or to, to destroy specific information. Um, they're going after usually because of an issue. Then we have the organized crime. This is where they're focusing on how do I get money from the information that I steal. Um, the hacktivist just doesn't mind if they destroy it, but the, the monetary guy, they want to make sure they get money from it. That's why there's different types of attacks for each of these key areas. And then, of course, the nation states. That's where we're looking at where we want to steal information because we're going to make our nation better or our company better. Um, there's a lot of uh, attacks that are out there specifically looking at stealing your data, especially for the universities because they have all this research, how we can get this information so we can take it away and use it for ourselves. So you've got to make sure you understand all those key areas. So one of the things that I always like to say is, you know, how do you get yourself prepared for when an attack actually happens. And so I, it's, it's a war. You kind of have to think of this as this is a war against the cyber crimes. The problem is you can't really see your, 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 your uh, attacker. It's all virtual. So you have to understand what's going on. You have to get prepared. But you have to also understand how they think and what they're doing. 
So when they're actually going after an attack or they have a, a plan to go after someone and their data, they have to think almost like a, a military person does. And they have to figure out, I'm gonna have to do a kill chain. This is kind of a, a four-phase approach that um, we look at in the military of what, when actually um, they go after a mission. They first have to identify the target. They then have to basically get the force dispatch where they're going to have a certain tools or technology or certain things they're going to have in the team that's going to go after them. They have to have a decision in regards to how they're going to respond, have a plan of action, and then they have to go after it. Again, it sounds basic, but this is exactly what every single attack that's going on is doing. It's hitting all those key areas. So if you switch it to a cyber attack now, it's the same situation that we're doing for all these, uh, the bad guys. They have the same plan that they're trying to do. They basically need to figure out what the target is, then they're gonna basically do some re reconnaissance, research, figure out exactly what's going on, how can I get the access, this is where they find your vulnerabilities. Then they basically put a development where they're gonna actually put a plan together of how they're gonna get access to you and how they're gonna uh, get after you. Then they're gonna figure out what kind of weapon they're gonna use, what kind of attack is gonna make a sense to basically get access to your information. Then they're gonna figure out how, what are methods to exploit that specific information. Once we get in there, how do we get access to the data if necessary as well? Then of course, this, this um, getting installed, getting into the system, um, going through the establishment, um, act on an objective. Now they're basically doing the attack, going out, working on it, until they get to the point where they actually do the exfiltration. They're actually getting access to the data and they pull it out. Every single attack has to go through the same process. So if we can think about this as a kill chain, if we can put some type of tripwires in between each of these key areas, now we're gonna be able to get an early warning detection about what's going on before they actually get to the data. And that's one of the biggest things you wanna do is how can you gain some knowledge about yourself? How do you get this early warning notification so that way you can quickly respond to these attacks when they happen? And then the, the, down below in the cost, this kind of shows you that if you don't catch it, between each of this time, the cost just keeps going up. So if you don't catch it quickly, then it cops keep, the cost keeps going up to the point where you have to now eradicate, and that costs a lot of money, and you have to notify the California to be so that you got to part, and you have to now lose your reputation as well. So it's a huge cost. So this is one of the, the crazy thing about this is that the spear phishing is probably one of the most effective ways to infiltrate the clients right now. We've seen 95% of the attacks on enterprise networks right now are usually through some type of spear phishing. Um, and what's going on is that people are still clicking on things that they think is part of the job or part of the responsibility or the email looks legit. And so this is where we need to make sure that we put a lot of emphasis on training your team and your uh, management as well as your staff to look for these type of things. Look for the emails that just doesn't make sense or something's just not right about it. 95%. Um, are the attacks are for the spear phishing. So I thought I'd give you a little example of what the spear phishing looks like. And um, there's so many different ways of doing this. This is just kind of one way. But let's say we have a threat actor, and they're going specifically after the CEO. So they can actually go onto Facebook or LinkedIn, and let's do some reconnaissance to figure out what's going on with, this, with the CEO or with, and who they know, what's going on. They get some information. Once they get that information, then they create a, a user, and they basically become part of the, um, you know, part of Facebook, and they put their own face, a, a different face on there. They pull the information, they then show that they have the same interest, and then all of a sudden they basically put in there, they try to become friends with them, or they try to be become a network. Once they get that network, now they have another way of getting in because now they have a close relationship, or at least a virtual relationship, but that sometimes is enough to get them information. Once they get that relationship, they get that information, now they create an email that's gonna be specifically to that specific person. And you can basically say, hey, talk to you on LinkedIn, or hey, I'm, I, I met you briefly at this conference. Thank you so much for your time. They put in a, a, a link inside there that basically is an infection, and they actually click on the link, or it could be a picture. Hey, um, I saw you at this, I took a picture of the group. You guys see this picture? There's so many different ways to do it. They click on it, all of a sudden they get infected. This happens all the time. This is exactly what happened with the politics side without going into the politics. This is exactly what they did. They created something specific, they threw a bunch of emails out, someone clicked on it, got infected, and they were able to pull the data out. This is happening all the time. And it's and, and spear phishing is specifically focusing on one person at a time compared to just doing a, a full phishing attempt. There are also other attacks that you kind of hear all the time. 
ransomware. Ransomware is basically, a lot of times they don't care about keeping the data themselves, they want to just lock it down. So all of a sudden, it's the same situation, they do spear phishing, but when they get access, they basically lock down the system so you don't have access to it. A lot of times they don't care if they get access to it, they just want to make sure you don't have access to it until they pay money. So this happens a lot where they basically get you to pay money, and a lot of times they actually will give you the data if you pay the money because they want to have the rep reputation of, hey, if you pay, we'll go ahead and, and give you the money. And a lot of times we find out that 50% of people actually pay the money compared to actually um, taking care of it and doing protection. So we're seeing a huge amount of ransomware, and it's still coming out today because people keep paying. We're also seeing more and more attacks that are non-malware-based. Non um, basically, we're seeing that uh, they basically get access to it instead of actually using a malware to infect, they actually get access using their, the, the different tools and functions if they have an administrator. Then they try to get administrator rights or user access rights, and they what we call living off the land. They basically just travel through the system. Even though they're not doing anything uh, aggressive yet, they're just kind of figuring out where they can go, get access to certain things, and once they get to certain things, then they might do a little bit more penetration, a little bit more aggressive uh, uh, attempts. And that way you're by, they're bypassing all the malware, all the different uh, um, antiviruses and different solutions you're putting in place, they're bypassing that. So the goal here is to better understand your environment so you know how to prepare yourself. Okay, so here's uh, one case study that we use. The thought process is, that, again, if we can basically put in place some type of tripwire to kind of use that information to respond quickly, then we can actually um, help prevent it. And using this intelligence can allow you to do that. So this is just one example of a, 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 a situation where someone got infected and it actually took um, basically one month before they even acknowledged, which is actually pretty good. It took a while for them to actually really realize something was going on. But what happened is they actually got inside the system, they, they, they got um, access to the data, they turned off all their functions and just sat there for a full month until everybody walked away and thought it was all clear. Then they came back and really grabbed all the data at one time and made a, made a huge change. And it took uh, a month before the loss was begins, and then it took two weeks to inf uh, exfiltrate, and then it took six weeks before the threat actors were actually getting access. So if we could just basically get some type of early warning right in the beginning, we can actually help prevent this. So here's just a couple of examples. There's basically seven different things they had to do to go through just to get that data. And the situation is most of the time, a lot of it, uh, companies don't have these little areas to kind of gather this information. They had to go through all these different areas. I won't go into all the details on each one of them, but there's different tools that you can do to get through to make sure they go through that kill chain to get all the way to the point where they now have access to the data. They turn themselves off so they don't get notified, and then they wait, and then when they finally have the time, they take all the data they want because they're not no one's prepared for it. And some of the tools, you can actually um, block or be detected in these key areas. And this is something that you can do right away and you can actually put in place to help analyze that information. So this is kind of just showing you a little bit of example of, of pulling this information and finding out how it can work directly into your network and to your endpoint solution. That way you can kind of pull some information directly out of it. One of the things we're trying to do on a regular um, part is to get yourself an early warning detection to analyze that information quickly and then respond to it effectively. And by having these little pieces in place, you can actually do that. One of the best ways of doing this is what we call our advanced endpoint threat detection. You actually can actually pull data from that information. You can use carbon black, you can use a red cloak, there's different solutions out there. You gather this information on a regular basis and then you basically analyze it. And you need someone that has the time to actually analyze the data because if you have a bunch of alerts, you don't know what's important, what's not, that's the key part. You, not, you gotta know what's exactly important to how to respond effectively. And the goal here, of course, you wanna reduce exposure, you wanna minimize your loss, and increase your confidence of your team. And sometimes it's not about finding or blocking the malware, it's more of detecting the bad guy and what they're doing, the behavior that they're doing, and so you can understand what they're doing, what they're accessing. So we kind of give a different mindset. You always think about block and detect and protect, but really I start thinking is maybe you need to just pull information from the bad guy more so you can figure out what they're doing and why they're doing it and then you can kind of quarantine that situation and then you can actually do something about it. So there's ways that you can kind of put that through. We're doing that time. 
So we want to talk about disrupting the kill chain. We kind of showed one example of, of disrupting the kill chain. I kind of broke down, you know, what are different tools that you can buy in place or services you can put in place to kind of help disrupt the, 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 um, the kill chain as well. In the beginning, by knowing your adversary, there's some key areas. The threat intelligence we talked about can actually give you information about your own environment. Um, vulnerability management services. So I don't know if you're doing any type of vulnerability scanning. Um, there's Qualys, uh, uh, Nexus, there's different Rapid7, there's met, met, different methods out there. That can pull information about that, can give you one piece to it. Um, security awareness training. This is huge. I don't know why most corporations aren't doing this, and even the schools aren't doing this, because people keep clicking on the things. If you're not doing some type of training on awareness, for the, then they're not going to know what to look for, and they're clicking on it. Targeted threat hunting. This is something that we're starting to do a lot more where companies are like, I don't know if I'm infected, it's just we have a lot of problems, what's going on? We actually go out there and actually do what we call threat hunting. So we actually put um, devices or, or agents on the different endpoints, we pull the information from the bad guy, to figure out where they're at, what's going on, because you can't eradicate them all uh, one at a time, you have to eradicate them all at one time. This now gathers all that information about where they're at, what's going on, and we help eradicate them all at one time. This is a great way to at least let the person know, hey, yes, you are infected, here's what we see, here's what they're having access to and what we can do about it. So this is a great way to kind of do some type of threat hunting. And of course, cyber attack simulation. A great way to do this is basically do some type of um, tabletop testing. Bring in the, the whole staff, the security staff, even if they're not security related, and basically give them an example. Okay, we just got attacked by spear phishing. Here's what they did, here's what they infinite, here's the tool they used. What do you do now? And if you don't have a plan to show how you respond to that, we need to make a plan. You need to figure out how and what you can do to basically respond to those incidences, and you need to start doing this on a regular basis. And I, I recommend, I don't know if, you, if the, the classes are doing this or not, but you should almost do this on a regular basis, do some tabletop testing and put some people in charge, and then you don't have to respond to this effectively. So the second area we talked about is doing more of a detect threat activity. And these are some other tools that you can add in to kind of help detect more effectively. Most of, this, most of you probably are familiar with this, but obviously you need the firewall. You need something that's going to detect a little bit more specifically your IDS, IPS, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems. Those specifically are signatures that are already out there that, that match up with the bad guys or the different types of attacks, and it can notify you right away. Every firewall should have one, um, or you should be having one um, working with you. Security monitoring. We're starting to see this is kind of what, what SecureWorks does, is that you, you can't have a person do everything all the time, and you don't have enough people, so it might be good to go ahead and allow some people to kind of do some monitoring for you. I'm just give you some blinders so you can kind of help you analyze it. So what we do is we actually pull the events for them and help analyze it. So security monitoring is definitely a way to help prevent that. Advanced malware protection detection. This is a little bit more of a sandbox technology. I don't know if you're familiar with what that is, but basically it's we analyze the data while it's coming in. It could be email, it could be traffic uh, for web, and we actually, anything that comes in that's being downloaded, we check it for our malware. And if it looks suspicious, we put it into a sandbox, we detonate it, analyze it, and say, yes, this is a, uh, a situation we need to block. And then we actually create signatures right there on the spot so we can now block it on an ongoing basis. These are different ways to help you kind of analyze that information as well. Security awareness training, that's probably almost in every single one of these areas because that should be a P you put in there. And also uh, target threat hunting as well. Last piece is they're now, they're now moving forward. They're already past the delivery. They're already past the weaponization. They're now trying to get access. So now they're in the system. You need to have the um, ability to uh, disrupt their, their access and what they're going after. And so there's different tools, points you have in here. Endpoint threat detection. This is going to allow you to gain that information about the endpoint pretty quickly. The IDS IPS, network security services. Um, and then the last piece here is eradication. Now they're at the point where they're almost at your data. There are still steps you can take before it gets to the point where they're actually taking access to your data. Um, one time, lots of times when you hear breach, you think, okay, these guys were breached, their thing was taken. A breach just means that they broke a window into your house. The question is, do you have everything locked in your, uh, in your house and they, you don't have access to anything? What you're worried about is being compromised. Did you lose personal information? Did you lose data? Did you lose PCI? Do you lose anything that's going to be reputable to your, to your institution or your company or yourself? Um, the goal here is you want to make sure you don't get compromised. And you've got to make sure you can prove that you actually just got broke a window and no one actually had access to anything. If it gets to the point where they now are close to getting access, you need to have some type of tools to help eradicate. 
log retention is one of the biggest things you need to do. If you don't have logs stored, and all of a sudden you need to now go, do back, go back and actually do some forensic analysis, there's no logs to analyze. You have to have logs stored. So one of the first things we say is, do you have all your logs stored and just put away and stored in the area? If you can have a SIM or if you have a way to kind of organize that, that data more effectively, that's great, but at least make sure you have a storage. We usually recommend three to six months. A year would be great. So it just kind of depends on the size. Um, we talked about advanced endpoint, active incident. Now it's to the point where we're almost there. It's now it's not a, a threat hunt. It's now basically an active incident, which means that you are infected and now we're actually actively looking for the bad guys because we know they're there. That costs much more. Threat hunting, you got one piece. When you actually know that they're there, the cost goes up and now you're trying to eradicate them. And of course, the um, eradication, that's the hardest part because you have to now put it on everything. So if you don't find every single access where they're at, then they're probably still there. So you've got to find that piece. So I'm not sure how we're doing on time. So there's a couple more things that we can talk about um, of kind of keeping, keeping in front of the, the, the bad guys and how to use the, the technology. One of the things you want to do is you want to be able to gain as much knowledge about your different inputs. You've got your data center, your endpoint, you have your mobile, you have your cloud. All these areas are, are separate divisions of data and separate divisions of information that you want to protect on a regular basis. So you need to make sure you're pulling information from them, either through a log analysis or through an endpoint management to kind of get information from it so you can kind of detect what's going on. What we recommend is putting into a system that analyzes that information and then matches up with additional intelligence. So you're taking your intelligence about yourself, you're taking intelligence about the bad guys, mixing it together, and now you have quick ways to respond effectively to, the, to be able to defend, prevent, and detect and analyze um, your environment more effectively. We talked a little bit about this. This is a key one. Make sure you pull your logs. If you're not sure what to log, I kind of gave a, a, a list of 10 items that you should log. Um, if you want a copy of this presentation, give me your card or your information. I can make sure I send it to you. Um, but there's a, there's a few different areas we recommend you pull some logs from. This is the advanced endpoint piece where you're actually going to pull information directly from it. The main goal here is you want to get, make sure you gain information, code, you want to gain information about the log events. You also want to make sure you pull up, you know, information about that system. You know, is, was there any registry changes? Was there an executable file that happened? Is the, is the bandwidth of that device increasing because of usage? Anything that stands out of the ordinary are alerts that you want to be aware of because it, anything out of the ordinary means that someone's either doing something they're not supposed to or someone's accessing, accessing your devices. This is great information you want to make sure you put together. Also, to know yourself, you have to do some testing. You have to get some visibility into your own environment. We always recommend to make sure that you do some type of vulnerability assessment or vulnerability scanning. You can also do some penetration testing. So now a difference between the vulnerability assessment is you're basically analyzing your vulnerabilities and we're getting information about how to respond. Technical testing is now saying, let, let me check to see if that vulnerability is true. You actually have someone try to attack you and get access to this information, see what they can get access to. You need to have those tests as well. And of course, I've talked about this a lot, security awareness training is a huge plus and one of the biggest issues if you don't move forward. This is just some, what I usually provide for my clients to kind of help them figure out where, where should they start because you have all these things, you figure out what, what do I do, how do I start, and where do I begin. Um, we usually start with the standard crawling. You've got to start, start basics in security and then kind of plan on you know, walking in and running. Um, we kind of talked about some of these key areas specifically, um, but this is kind of what we, we, we come together with our clients to kind of help build the right plan, figure out what they need, what kind of technology do they already have, and what do they need to buy? Since we don't actually sell the technology, we want to help our clients understand if they have enough information. Sometimes buying more technology is not going to make, a, make you more effective. You need to make sure that you plan on what you have for the technology and make it more effective it's, itself. And that's kind of what we try to help with our clients. That's pretty much it. I, I want to make sure we kind of touch on everything. One of the, the key things that I want to always bring up at the end is that um, you know, no matter what information that you do, you want to make sure you gather as much information about yourself. You want to gain the knowledge about the bad guys. You want to make sure you be able to information, provide that information necessary to your team so you can work on it more effectively. 
and then put a plan together on how you're going to respond specifically to incidents when they actually happen. Um, the, the attacks are happening on a regular basis. If you're not prepared for it, then, then you're going to be behind the, the eight ball. So you have to make sure you're prepared for it. Um, I don't know if you have any, any questions. Yes? Or an observation. Okay. Anything from the RAN uh, centrifuge destruction to the break into the email servers is all been focused in the human. And that is you'll never, ever, no matter how much training you give, you'll have 100% insurance that someone's not going to push a button. That's a reality check. Exactly. You can put all the stuff on the back, all the technology, all the snippers, whatever you want, it just takes one person. Human is, is the biggest weakness of that security. Is that we are kind of spending a great deal of time building more tools and toys and all that versus how do you take the human out of the loop? How do you make the human redundant or un- they, they never had the ability. If you focus in on the human, uh, one thing I, some of my actual work at Boeing, I have to be very careful about, but I discovered an interesting situation. Networks mirror the human mind. Why? Because the people who developed it were humans. Now, everything from the operating system to what things operate, operate on the human mind. But illusionists, magicians, we were called them over centuries, had discovered what parts of the brain can be focused in to hide and adjust and work. And they've got literally centuries of understanding how humans operate. And that's what people recognize is that hackers are focused on the human. And while you're busy building these tools here, they're using centuries of development of how the mind works to get around that and not worry about it. So the real issue that's going to eventually get this out of here is you find a way to prevent the human from being able to access. You have to let the computer handle the access in a way that you can trust the computer, but you don't trust the human. Yep. I mean, let's be honest. Every major break-in from Lockheed Martin's uh, loss of the F-35 to this and this and this was an attack where they found someone's code to get in. And to that point in, here. Yep, and that's that's one of the biggest. And you saw um, security readiness training over and over in every single area. Training will never be enough. Yep. Particularly at the executive level. To be blunt, most executives are totally technically illiterate. Not the chief engineer. They are not technically illiterate, and they can't waste it. They won't take the security training seriously. They'll take it. Click, click, click through because they're too busy. This is IT will take care of this for me. I don't worry. Our system will protect me. I don't have to think about it. That's why how many of these break-ins have been at the top level? They know the mindset. They know their target. Yep. So you've got to eliminate the human from the equation if you want any chance of tying this down. Yeah, and that's the hardest part because the humans are doing all the work. So the, what, we're, what we're seeing, and this is why you're seeing the, the California Cybersecurity Task Force and everybody else is really trying to put a huge notice on everybody, almost like with, with earthquakes. You know, stop, drop, and roll. You know, or, or, or you know, hide underneath things. Or, one. I keep the heart, I, I, I start to beat on this. If we keep thinking of the train better and better and better, that presumes that it will stick, they'll remember, they won't be half asleep, they won't be middle night, press the key. It only takes one. Exactly. Having involved in weapon systems that have protection for nuclear safety, there is no there is no probability of allowance. There's zero. Right. And that's one of the reasons why when we talk about security, we always say you just have to acknowledge that you most likely are already infected. And if you have that mentality, now it's basically figuring out how and what you can do to prepare yourself with early warning decisions that you can actually respond quickly to them because it, you're right, there's almost impossible to say you're not going to be breached. So the question is, you've got to put these tools in place to help maintain that. And the, the problem right now though is most people still have security, even management don't really think, I mean it's changing, we're seeing a huge change from security getting pushed from the, um, the, the, up from the, the, um, the tech room to, to the boardroom. We're seeing that change now. 
but it's been a slow, gradual process. I've been doing this for 16 years, and it's, we have the same problems in a lot of the public systems today as we did with the financial industry 10 years ago. Why is that? It's because of the slow process. It hasn't affected me, so I don't have to worry about it. That's all changing now with all these type of things. So you're exactly right. The, the human is one of the biggest issues, and that's why you have to have these early warning things in place as well. Yes? And, and are, is, is uh, cybersecurity being become more important to a lot of these other countries, or, or are they becoming? Um, where the opportunities are? Okay. Um, so basically, what we're seeing a, a huge increase for cybersecurity all over the all over the world, and it's in all different areas because, again, there's not enough people doing the work. So one of the things that we're seeing, uh, uh, just SecureWorks in general, we're we're growing huge in Asia as well as in Europe because they're they're having the same problems. Even though they all have their own individual problems, we're still seeing a huge increase in that information. And what we're noticing that the attacks that are happening in Europe are the same attacks that are happening in, in the U.S. It's the same technology, the same different things. It's just coming from different areas or from specific areas as well. So we're seeing a huge amount of information. Um, there's so many different areas of cybersecurity that you can get into. Um, obviously, the engineering side, the, the, um, the, the, the software side, and then also the, the human side, the analyst side, being able to analyze the data. There's so many different aspects. You need to have all three to really be able to be successful in, in security as well. I don't know if I hit that question for you or not. But. Was there any other questions? Yes. What was that? Do you think the DMV incident that is a ransomware? It was a ransomware, yeah. So, ask one more time, sorry. Um, do you think the recent DMV case is a ransom uh, case? And then the second question is, uh, what about the election day that if someone else would attack the security system and how the public sector can protect the border and the investigation? Okay. Yeah, the first question was in regards to the DMV and their um, specific attack. There was a, actually, DMV had a couple issues that happened specifically. Um, one was ransomware, and then one also was a breach of data um, specifically. So ransomware is designed specifically to just prevent data from getting accessed. And then there's also the one that specifically is taking the data and then selling it off for, for money. Um, the DMV specifically had both those situations happen. Um, and what the biggest issue on their side is that they, did, they had the alerts they didn't respond to it. Is there a question? Okay. So one of the things that we noticed is that they actually had the data necessary to be able to make the response. They had the alerts. They just did not respond effectively. And that's one of the biggest issues because they have you, you have these alerts that tell you, but if you don't respond and know exactly how to respond to it or to know if this is a, a true alert that's important or not, you don't know what's going on. And the bad guys, if they're really smart, they're going to make a bunch of alerts going out in different areas and different places to make it look like they can't tell exactly where it's at. One of the reasons why we see denial of services, the denial of services is designed specifically to distract the person while they're actually coming from behind and doing the attacks on the other side. So it's the crazy side of this whole thing is that everything